Welcome, everyone. We have Jan, Dan, Nick, Dave, and myself, Michael, and BSD CAN has just wrapped up. Uh, I will allow you to share your opinions as they fly, but sadly, there is some tragic news. Mike Carroll's died on the way home, and it was delightful to see have seen him a few days ago. And in fact, we had our first real conversation. It's just tragic news. He was at BSDI back in the day. He's been involved in the community in some way for decades. And he was the is was the backup release engineer and I believe released FreeBSD 13.3. Uh, and I just got signed out of this document mid discussion. Uh, do you have any comments, thoughts on Mike? Facts to share? It's like he got to do what he liked at the end. Nicely put. Don't note my password, Mike, but it's long enough to hopefully take it long enough. So, uh, Dan, did you work closely with Mike on anything? No, most of my contact with Mike was through BSD CAN each year. I believe Patrick was saying last year he gave, I believe, an 80 minute just history tour and story time, I suppose we call it. And yeah, Mike was all, oh, yeah, I'll probably do 20 minutes. No one wants to hear about this. And then it's like, uh, lunch is starting. We got to go. And so he was, Mike was awesome. He was soft spoken, he was positive. A delight. So may he rest in peace. Isn't you said interesting ad hoc talk about the history of the original internet message processor. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So basically, yeah, no, it's not like the written record says. We have a link to that for what it's worth. We did what? 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 If I don't remember. It must have been, I think, two thousand eighteen or so. I'll paraphrase you here. Uh, if, cool. uh, I'll come on to If there is a recording, it's bound to be terrible. Understood. Uh, Antrenig, we I just shared the news that Mike Carroll's passed away. And Dan and I saw him just the other day. Condolences. Thank you. He seemed like a good guy. He used to run the, a lot of the parts of the Dev Summit a couple of years ago. Oh, interesting. Yeah, like, you know, slides and such of statistics, etc. I remember them very well. Antonik, do you have topics to add to the agenda? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, uh, next week, sorry. Okay, cool. No, don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. Uh, Dave, are you willing to go first? And you're muted. Yeah, yeah, I think I am. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so I think was it was it last week or the week before I, I, we talked a little bit about um, this CI stuff and the, and the jails part of it, and um, what I wanted to share today was was two pieces. Let me find the sherry thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Share screen. Oh, no. It looks like it, it eats your share out of the into the That's universe. Fine. Yes, I have no problem with that. If the font's too small, tell me. Um, so on the left, it's right? definitely it's going to be small. too small for the recording. Yeah, because the recording excellent. is compressed full HD and excellent, excellent. Oh, yeah, Chris, welcome. Um, so welcome. what's kind of interesting about this at the moment is. Um, sort of most of you will be familiar with um, doing stuff in C and um, or or at least vaguely familiar with stuff in C and how multi-process stuff is really hard. And um, the front end part of this is written in another language called um, Elixir, which is, uh, let's call it a, a variant of Erlang, which is a highly concurrent language, which makes multi-process stuff concurrency just shockingly easy. Um, and my goal for this project as a whole is to have a a defined specification for what a job entails in UCL, and that's pretty similar to everything else you've already seen. We can look at that briefly. Um, and also what I think 
what I hope is different is to have a defined interface for the agent talking to the server, um, which is kind of missing from all the other CI tools. And the hope for this is that people will take my um, Lua plus C version, which talks to jails, or this Elixir version, which um, doesn't use jails, but then has the advantage that it runs happily on Windows or whatever platform you want um, really easily and go, uh, I need to run this, I don't know, on um, NetBSD Toaster ver version 3.1 and I'm going to skip out all of this other stuff because it's not necessary, but I can communicate out over a serial port and therefore I can run Toaster CI on my, the, yeah, I can run continuous integration on my Toaster firmware. Um, that's kind of the goal. So I thought it'd be interesting to have a quick look at that and get people's um, uh, sort of 10 cents on that. So what do I want to start off with? Um, a bigger font, the I, um, and let's just get some UCL. UCL. Is this not in the, man, where is the UCL stuff? The format, it might not be in a branch yet. Um, Oh, actually, no, it's in the client, isn't it? Duh. Right, okay. Yeah, cool. So, um, this is what this, the CI stuff looks like so far. And um, the main point for using US, UCL is it's effectively equivalent to JSON, which means every language has a parser. And so what happens is we have a small layer of C that deals with um, shoveling in UCL. I wrote a um, uh, like a, uh, a foreign function interface for um, Erlang and Elixir to be able to read this as well. And we slip it in. And in most cases, the um, items can be left out. The goal I wanted was if you throw it a bare repo, it should go, oh, there's only a make file here and you're on BSD. So let's just try make. Um, if you're on some other programming language, we'll try and figure out what that is and run the appropriate thing for that. So the idea would be the on road for CI should be ridiculously small. If your program runs today, you should just be able to add it to CI and have it do the right thing for that programming language. Um, Yana, have we got a schema yet? Not yet, but soon. Um, one of the um, things I did want to have was schema validation, um, but that's that presents some problems. The current iteration has the ability to nest stuff, and I haven't figured out how to do that in schemas. Um, um, why don't I you see think I figured that out. I can share an yeah. example schema. And yeah, so we should should there, talk right. about that later, actually. That'd be great. Um, so I'm not going to go through the details on this. This is like version 0 0.1, and the goal is um, to be container-ready. Um, tags these things are actually just inherited from operating system variables in, in practice um it could be an array but doesn't really matter so this when i inject it into the process i literally just put this into the environment as as is um these are branches we care about branches we don't care about um any environment variables we want to throw in um there was a reason why these are in lowercase i can't remember what it is anymore but there was a reason for it. Um, and then the sort of classic pipeline stuff, you have an array of tasks um, and each um, sort of object under that we loop over in, um, in serial. And if you want them done in parallel, um, instead of using an array, you use an object and then we do them all at once. Um, that's the next chunk of functionality and I need to add in the next couple of weeks to do things in, in um, a pipeline. Um, and I don't think there's anything really interesting in that. Um, oh yeah, here's a thing where we scoop up some artifacts at this stage and and upload them. Um, initially, I was going to upload these over WebSockets because I already have a WebSocket connection for sending the um, status messages through, but um, it's just simpler not to use the WebSockets for this and have every upload go over HTTP um, put. Yeah. Um, WebSockets makes it easy to do this stuff, but then you end up sort of having to marshal data in and out. And it turns out that um, curl is really, really, really good at uploading stuff um, 
with HTTP put and post, and it's better just to rely on that. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'd love some help with it, sorting out a schema yarn, and I'll talk to you later about that. Um, so that's our UCL stuff, and it's pretty kind of standard. If I've got a um, simple, and we've got one here. Can you bump up yeah. the font a little? The bigger. The oh, I'm gonna make screen. it bigger. Um, yeah, beautiful. Any, this everybody is, helps. No, I don't know where my simple repo is, but it's not this one. This is another project called Simple. I think I have a lot of projects called Simple. Um, <laughs> anyways, it's kind of nice developing this on FreeBSD because we can do this um, sudo ingrep. I don't know what the other group do is, do is ingrep. Um, now, WebSocket stuff by its nature is, is half compressed, is, is compressed on the way um, in, but on the client side, I choose not to compress it so I can read the messages. Um, and we've got our browser already open, so let's close the browser. So this is an output of a, of a, of a previous job, and it's kind of pretty, I'm not an HTML guy, so this is as good as you get here, but it's got like the little uh, cute things here to, to consolidate sections. And from the agent side, from the from the client side, if you just print out anything with three tildes in front, we just assume that it's going to be a section. And um, there's a, a a handcrafted parser because it's just there's only like three types of tokens, so it wasn't worth doing a proper one. There's a handcrafted parser that just looks for these three things, and if it sees one of those, you're in a section. And when it sees a second one, you must have left the previous section, and that's kind of how we do it. Uh, and I want to add line numbers to this next and a little bit of color. Um, and then I've probably exceeded my HTML stuff. So let's see if we can run a thing. What have we got here? Um, I'm just going to get rid of all of the old jobs. Um, you know, um, to do. Uh, where are we? Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so that got rid of all the current jobs. And if I've done this right, I just go bin agent. Um, I think that's all I need. I've been working on my laptop previously. So there we go. There's some WebSockety stuff handled. Um, the Elixir version this week is ahead of the Lua slash C version. So we're looking at that. And then in a week, a couple of weeks' time, I should have caught up. It's much easier to write for me to write code in a language I'm very, very familiar with um, and then go back and figure out what worked and what didn't and then roll it into... Um, uh, let's just have a look here. We... Got too much stuff in the way. Let's stop this, clear the screen, and restart this so we can see the happy little web sockets. Um, uh, agent. Yeah, so where's this thing coming from? I've got this window open. That's what I need to get rid of. Try it again without the without the web noise. Um, stop the agent. Reconnect. Here we go. Here's our little... Um, bad cafe, no bad coffee uh, connection from the agent, upgrades to WebSockets, and then it sends a couple of compressed messages back. And finally, we get this one that says accepted. And this means that the uh, request from the agent to register and the token it's provided, which is zero bad coffee for everyone today, is accepted. And that's basically all there is to it here. We then make, um, let's see if we got one here, this is a little bit long for the moment, but this is a functional programming language. So everything returns a result. Everything's, everything's an expression. And we sort of pass data structures from one part of the program to another um, rather than assigning things to variables and so forth. So what we're doing here is some pattern matching. We sort of read it from right to left. We call a function called create a workflow, which has a, um, an associative array. We call them maps. Um, we, we have another function here that's just generated in line, um, some date time stuff, the URL that we want to clone from, and a cache directory, and the ref we want to clone. That should all be familiar. But the cool thing about Elixir and these other functional programming languages is we take the result of this and we pattern match it back onto the struct. So this OK is um, what we call an atom or a, a symbol in other programming languages. It's fixed. You can't assign to it. And this lowercase thing without a colon in front is a variable. And if the create workflow function succeeds, it will turn this tuple back with OK. And therefore, the variable will be bound, the variable flow will be bound to the result it sends. 
that's pretty different to what people uh, to what people do here. So let's see if this stuff works today. Oh, that's a bit disappointing. Oh, we were doing it on Linux, so we don't have Git. So um, let's go and fix that. Um, where are we at for this? This must be an agent. Git. And um, there we go. That should feel a bit more, a, a bit safer here. So let's just stop that, uh, run that, um, redo a job. And it's pretty quick. It cloned. The stuff in red is not an error. It's just, I did it in red, so it's easy to see. And what we should see over here in our WebSocket stuff is stuff going forward and back. Here's our request coming in over WebSockets. Um, and we have these sort of tagged messages with a colon at the front. And in this case, there's a JSON blob at the end. So I don't know if that's legit, but it was certainly convenient. So it's plain text at the front, followed by JSON appended on the end of it. And um, the rest of the results here that's being sent are, are compressed. So this whole agent to do, upload the files and so forth is, uh, let me look here. It's 160 lines of code. And most of it is white space stuff. It's really, really, really simple. We send stuff over web sockets by just passing a message from one bit of the program to the other. So that's kind of really weird for people. This is already concurrent. So concurrency is really easy. Um, let's just start at the top here. I define a couple of modules. We don't really care what they are here. And this one here, I give my module, my, my um, first process a name, just call it web sockets. And that means Thereafter, I can just send message, messengers to it. And then further down the bottom, um, I start this here. Um, now that's concurrent. The agent is now concurrent. And when I want to spawn, where do I do it here? Um, yeah, here's where I spawn off a process to run my, my git clone command. And it consumes standard error, and it ignores any pipe failures. So it'll keep going until, um, until it's finished. And this runs async, so it's running in a separate process, um, not a not like a thread process. It's a, a th if you're in Java, you would call it like a green thread. Maybe it's um, uh, what is it? Hors concurrent CSP. What does CSP stand for again? Continuation passing style. Yeah, continuation passing. Yeah, continu continuation passing. So that's kind of how it works. That all of these processes are multiplexed. Onto a to single be clear point. though, to be clear though, because I, I love this part. Yeah, it's not quite the same. Yeah, it's not. It's in in, in when, when we say like Java VM, it's not a VM. It's just a process that does some useless things. But when we say the Erlang VM, it's like an actual VM. A process hmm. has a PID. It has a message box. It has a function that it's executing. It has a uh, like it, it, it acts like a whole operating system. I mean, if, yeah, if you could write, yeah. process restart. Yeah, so this is one of the things that I love about Erlang. You won't be able to read the little lettering here, but I can connect to the the, the stuff up here. This is the server that's running. Um, uh, Zen. Just spawned a repo. Sorry? You just spawned a repo no. there and then launched with the, uh, basically the system monitor. Oh, no, th this, in fact, so I had to run it in the other terminal. This is actually another Erlang VM connecting to this Erlang VM. Just so, so they're not clustered into a single. These are completely separate process, um, completely separate programs even. This one is even running a different version of Erlang um, because I'm lazy. So I can connect to this one and I can say, hey, show me all the little mini processes that are running in here. And you can see there's like lots of them here. There's, you know, several hundred of them. Um and, and the, 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 there are two nice parts in here. The, the, the first one is that uh, uh, it, it, it creates one thread per one computer thread, right? One OS thread per one computer thread. So it does proper load balancing out of the box. And the second nice thing here is if I, I think if you scroll at the top of your REPL, it should say D-Trace if you're running on FreeBSD. Because no, it does, it, and it, it is running D-Trace, except it's off the yeah, it, yeah, it, it does have also D-Trace support. So like via D-Trace, you can know which uh, line of code is executed by which function. And you can even like trace the scheduler uh, on FreeBSD. And to be fair, it is, I mean, a lot of the Erlang features work very nicely with FreeBSD stuff. 
Yeah, the original D-Trace support for Erlang, which is the underlying VM, was done by uh, Scott Fritchie for FreeBSD, specifically when he was at Basho um, a long time ago. But you can see the – it's not very exciting because the threads aren't doing anything. There's like 16 schedulers um, here, and there's 16 ones that handle dirty I.O., um, and there's 16 ones that handle um, sort of CPU-bound tasks, and you can choose which one you want to run it on. And it's super low in memory. I'm using for a full-blown web server and all these concurrent processes plus database connections, we're using about 65 megs of memory here. Um, so it's not a hog like a Rails application or something like that. Um, and for all of these little sort of mini processes, we can actually see them as a tree here. And you can really see this looks like an operating system. Um, you might not be able to read these here, these words. Let's pick a couple out. It's got its own kernel. Um, and you can see here that it's clearly a tree of processes and there's a supervisor at the top that manages smaller pieces underneath it. Here's logger, like it's like a syslog thing inside itself, its own little logger. Um, it's got stuff for handling talking to standard error. Um, and then over here, it's got some um, user read and writers, which is what's handling my shell here. And um, our web server is running in these bits here. Um, there's a pub sub implementation. So most software developers would go, okay, I need pub sub, so I'm going to put in Redis, or I need a message queue, so I'll add RabbitMQ. Um, and in Alexa, we just go, that's all built into the runtime. We can just reuse these things. Um, another one is another one. If there's if they need like a, a persistent storage, there's also a table management in in Erlang called uh, ETS, which can work in it, which can work in memory or it can work on disk or it can work on both. And it also has uh, it's it's also primitive. We call it like a a meta database that allows you to create your own database with your mm -hmm. own syntax and your own whatever you need. So like when you're using an Erlang VM, the only piece of software that you need is an Erlang VM. It has a uh, scheduling, you don't need cron, it has uh, pop sub, you don't need Redis or MQTT, it has uh, uh, a database, Manesia, you don't need PostgreSQL, it has service management, you don't need systemd or anything else. Basically, it, it acts like a whole operating system. I mean, yeah. at, at some at, yeah. at some telecoms, what they have is just a Solaris box that starts an Erlang VM, and that's it. Like that, that's the only thing that it does. Yeah, for months, for years on end, and some people have actually made there's at least let me think now two, three bare metal Erlang versions where you boot directly to Erlang. There's one that's um, I would love to, for these guys to do a free a EuroBSD con talk sometime, but. They took the FreeBSD network stack, the Erlang VM, smooshed them together with, I think, free RTOS and made a bootable um, Erlang Unix operating system all in one go. And that's really, really neat. Um, so what do we what do we have a bit interesting You're here? You're saying someone made a unicorn with a working debugger. With a working what, sorry? Debugger. Yes, yes, basically yes. <laughs> Yeah. That was very funny, but yeah. <laughs> um, but that, it's actually, it's in cars. So I think all of the German car industry uses this. So we shouldn't mock it as being something that's kind of quirky and unique. This is really, really extensively used. Um, so here we can see this little process down here. That's the agent. This is actually a WebSocket connection, and it's got this little blue link going all the way up the top, if you can see it, this blue link. Um, it's a bit... Unfortunately, I've got a lot of um, processes hanging around to handle WebSocket connections, but it keeps going up and eventually it goes back and links to um, this thing up here called the flow. So the flow is actually the um, agent that's running the uh, the um, the job. And if we make a new job, um, you'll see this number out here will disappear and a new one will start. Um, Let's go, go away. And so now we have, uh, let's just scroll across again. It's a bit fiddly to get right here. So the previous job finished, and now we have a new one that's um, um, up here as well. And so that's kind of how it works is um, the job finishes, it shuts down, a new one's ready to go. Um, and when I want to have multiple versions of this, it's going to be really easy. 
I'm not going to have multiple processes. I'll just have another one of these trees that handles it. Um, and the only thing that's kind of interesting here is it's not so easy to see, um, but um, we have these little info messages here. Here's the sort of the state machine saying, oh, I've uploaded all the files. Um, that I haven't written yet, um, the bit to do that. I've done the work on the seaside to handle it with um, using Blake 2 for hashing, um, but I haven't actually written the upload code. And then at the second stage, the final stage, it says I ended, okay, we're all done. Um, prior to that, the previous state, we, we should go to the beginning. Where does it start? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah Michael, uh, there, 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 is, there is a notion of isolation. So every PID has its own uh, isolated memory. Uh, this is done by on purpose. And a good uh -huh. example of this is whenever you do, let's say, a three-way telephone call, right? Uh, if it was a, if it was written, let's say, via Python or PHP, and one of the connections fail, the whole call would fail. Or okay. in real life examples, and this was true in the in the sixties, that if one of the calls between two people failed, the whole phone box failed, right? So every connection on that box. And, but with the, in the Erlang VM, if one connection fails, only that single connection fails. So only the PID that's managing that connection, right? Mm -hmm. So the, and the, this was like that was their initial reason for creating Erlang back in the day, which is to have proper process isolation and also a higher level abstraction so mm. that if, if if something fails other things and this is also true in the in the web in the web application layer you know many times you'll see uh let's say a node application or a python application and as soon as the state is corrupted every other request gets goes to a hellhole uh that is not true in erlang if if a single process goes bad everything else continues to work as is so a great example of this is i can I don't know how well this comes out over the, the stream, but certainly the, the video should be they're seeing it here. Um, these little pairs of processes are either WebSocket connections or HTTP um, services waiting for um, the next request that comes in. And they're really lightweight. They're about 2K each. Um, they used to be a lot lower, but that was under 32-bit CPUs. And now on 64-bit CPUs, I think we're up to about, um, about 2K per, per lightweight process but they're all totally isolated. And so I can send this pair here, uh, the pair above it, I'll kill this process off. The parent, the two children under it will die. We'll get a nice red message on the left here. Wow. But the rest of it just continues to run. And it's kind of disappointing that it's, I've got to scroll down again to find it. Um, but that's gone, it reappears. This is still working. It's still getting its little ping pongs from the server um, every 30 seconds or whatever it is. and nothing is broken up here so i can send another job through and it just works um so it really is like a little operating system inside an operating system um and all that's of this just been shoveled at all um mit or apache 2. so this is the way yeah i i i i, I do think it's mit now so yeah. pulling it to um, jails is this roughly the ci you described in coimbra yeah, can, yeah. So I, I haven't actually tried it, this. Perhaps with Faraz. I haven't tried this yet. To um, if we go back to Cly, um, since adding all the code here, I haven't tried to see if this works. Um, I mean, let's just see what happens. Um, I assume the jail is ready. Uh, jail, 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 jail. No, I, I need to rebuild my libcurl to get. WebSocket support again. That's that's bad me. Let's do that right now. <laughs> um, it's got to have WebSocket support to send messages. Um, but what's really fun about this is um, when you look at the architecture on the inside, we have this. Every time I want to add a function, so where's a good example? Oh yeah. Here's how I receive the messages over WebSockets. I just get, um, where's a good one here? And uploads. Oh yeah, here when it fails. So at the end of the stream, um, we get a pretty standard Unix um, uh, uh, error, error, error code back, um, zero or, or, something, or something worse. And 
these just come in via um, a, a message here. This is just a tuple, um, so pretty lightweight internal data structure. And we do a little pattern matching. Zero status code means it's okay. Anything else is a fail. And this builds up our response. And we don't need to check what type it is. We just send it back over the WebSocket connection. WebSockets have both text frames and binary frames. So I'm using text frames for this so that when I can I can read them on the wire as they come through here. And this goes over WebSockets to our, our server process. And if we look down here for uh, the stop ones, where are we here? Stop, stop, must be down here. Yeah, here we get this message from this one here where we say end OK. Um, goes over WebSockets, gets pulled out here and dispatched to this function and it prints out a little log so we can see it. And then it broadcasts over this sort of internal pub subsystem um, with, a, with a target message of the flow, the workflow, and appended the ID that it's got. So this, this, this ID here. And this other completely isolated process worker here is um, just when it starts up um, here, it subscribes to that workflow. And this is actually the part that creates the WebSocket request that gets sent to the agent to, to run the job. Um, it just waits here for messages to come back that it's interested in. So anytime someone sends um, um, a message to it, well, it'll get up, it'll, it'll turn up here as a like a stop message or a fail here when it's when the job failed, and we just go through the usual cycle of things. We um, clearly we're going to finish, so we say we don't want any more updates. PubSub is off. Um, we update uh, update it with success because stop means it completed successfully, um, and if. For some reason, we're unable to update the database. We we just log an error message that it failed. And in every other case, we just stop this process cleanly because the update worked. And all this is done with message passing. Um, there's no need to um, worry about um, leaking memory because each one of these processes, as Antrinig said, has its own little local heap. And that allows the VM to be really effective with garbage collecting. Um, when this process is finished running, so this job might run for, you know, 10, 15 minutes tops, um, it'll shut itself down, and then that entire process, including its heap, can be garbage collected. So you don't have any of the stop the world um, garbage collection problems that both Go and um, Java spent so many years trying to engineer around. Here that just doesn't exist because you don't have these processes that run for um, hours on end that create lots of heap garbage that then someone else needs to clean up. The process finishes and all of its garbage can um, can be lost at once. The kind of only other thing that's interesting about this is it's not really obvious from this code, but every process has its own queue of messages that arrive for it, what we call a mailbox. And so what happens here is that the client here is generating logs maybe faster than the server can send them over the network. And they sort of bubble up in here, get sent over the WebSocket connection, they receive by the WebSocket handler, and then they get passed over to this job here. And it has the nasty work of doing things like updating database state, pushing new log entries into the database so we don't lose them. Um, and its message queue might grow um, as, it's, as it gets through them, but it doesn't bottleneck any other parts um, of the system. Um, and it makes it really, really simple to manage memory here. When this task is finished, um, all of the excess memory that it needed while it was accumulating the logs for the last you know, 10, 15 minutes will just get bundled up and, uh, and washed away and garbage collected when the process is finished. So overall, we end up with, I think, four processes involved here without any real concurrency concerns. Um, we have the agent, which is strictly speaking its own. Um, we can try and install it here. There's a package install. Yeah. There we go. We can install our curl here and try this and see if we can uh, 
get this job to work. Um, so we have the agent itself, one process, it's a separate Erlang VM or the Lua C um, Chimera that I built. We have the handler process here, which is dealing with receiving WebSocket connections. And we have a worker that owns the state of this particular job. And all of these three things are separate um, and they do little different bits of work. There's a one further process um, and this doesn't really make sense at all to, to view in the, in the console here, but it handles the web server state of the active job. And if I've got a, uh, uh, yeah, here we go here. This job I deleted from the, from the database. So we'll just ignore that, but I can't ignore it, can I? Curse you. Here we go, here's one. Um, here's a completed job. This one isn't very exciting at the moment because it just cloned the repo. Um, but I don't read these logs from the database as they come in. Um, they're just sent over PubSub. So this makes it really, really nice and easy to write the code for it because it's so decoupled. Um, the WebSocket agent gets the messages that come in and it just broadcasts these out to any process that subscribes to it. So if there's no user connecting, watching the logs actively, then there's no one listening to it and there's no work to be done. But if five or six people around the world are very interested in this amazing Git clone um, job, then they can all watch it and um, each one of them will be receiving their own little pub sub messages as the logs come in, off, off they get sent. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's a really, really different way of writing code compared to the, the sort of lower world. And let's see what happens now with the server when we um, try to run a jail. Um, what's going to happen is the server code and the client code currently disagree about the protocol they're using. Um, so something should crash somewhere. We'll see what happens here. So there we go. The, um, we couldn't create a jail here, probably because I haven't run setup. But on the server side, um, we get all of this nice crashing here. And the important piece here is that the rest of the VM is still running. Um, it's nicely fault isolated. And we've told that in the handler in line 12, let's go there and have a look. Line 12, um, we received a message that it doesn't know how to pattern match. So um, what I would typically do here is um, I would go down, so this is an, another error one here, I would just add another clause in here with whatever we're missing from this. I don't, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head what we're missing here, but we're missing some, um, some code here. And it's just another one of these little blocks of sort of five or 10 lines to do it. And it's just such a nice way of developing software. You add code here to do what you want, put the message on the WebSocket, run it, watch it crash, figure out what sort of, I think of it as a shape, what you're missing here, and then add another clause to handle it. And I don't even need to restart it. It just can be done live, uh, which is kind of weird. Um, I don't think any other programming language I've used does this quite the same way. Some of the Lispy world um, has things like this, but not the hot code reloading because it relies um, on having isolated per process state to be able to do that. You can't reload code if the runtime of each sort of little process is um, mixed up with the runtime of other processes. Uh, but that's, that's where it at the moment. So what have I got to do next? Um, bring the C library up so that it can um, it sends the same messages as the shares the same protocol as the um, current Elixir one, and then add file upload. And then at this point, I should be in the position of being able to use my CI to build my CI, if, if, that, if that makes sense. Um, but that's pretty cool. So my long term aim here is that the Lua side will be very much the I know I'm running on Unix, and that's the way I like it. Thank you very much. Um, where we do jails and um, um, anything like that. And the Elixir version um, will be for platforms like uh, Windows or other places where maybe we don't, we don't need jails, 
Um, and we, we're quite happy doing builds in, in user space, for example. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, the only other thing is I've got a lot of, when we think of these pipelines um, back here, the sort of UCL stuff here with each of these tasks, um, I've got an older version of Elixir code that already handles the sort of consumption of this. Um, so it's going to be pretty quick to pull that out, but I need to add this to the lower code, which is likely to be a bit more, uh, a bit harder for me to do. And then the final stage for this, which I hope to get done before you're a con, is to add hooks at each stage of the life cycle. So um, if I've got a job that runs here where we can actually see it, it's a bit annoying having all the SQL data in the middle, but um, here we go. Here's where we create the job in the first place, this sort of assigned one. And um, here's the first sort of data coming back. That's an empty line. Here's a, here's, a, here's a line coming back. And what I want to have is the ability to execute a little sandboxed lower code at each stage of this. So one before you clone the repos that allows you to mount file systems, um, fetch, special jail configurations if you need them, set up any networking. Another one that runs um, inside the jail um, after it started. Another one that runs at the end. So very much the same life cycle we already have for jails, but add a little lure hook at each stage of it for you to do whatever CI stuff you want uh, You want to in that. Um, but uh, yeah, right now it's pretty cool. You can run multiple agents already and it figures out which um, agent to run the task on. It doesn't make a very good job yet of deciding what the best one is, um, but it does know that there's you know, different agents and they have different capabilities. Yeah, so we did, it's kind of like a, let, we mentioned there's a database. Let's have a look at this. Where, do, what have we got um, here? Uh, agents. So this is a very small table in this inbuilt database. Um, and here we can see that there's the, the, the agent with the bad cafe token. Um, and here's its process ID, which is how we communicate internally. And here are the tags that were um, submitted when it registered. It's on FreeBSD and it's an AM64. And there's a special user queue I call CI, um, that sort of arbitrary. Um, and this is all built into the language. You don't need to pull in Redis or, or Postgres for that. You can sort of add anything you like in here and you can see that the programming language itself, the runtime is making extensive use of this already. There's lots of stuff for Postgres, um, for the WebSocket handler, all of this is managed through these internal tables here. Um, what else we're interested in here? Yeah, so the message passing is so extensive that even IO like um, your the REPL here that we have, um, the communication over, this is a TCP network socket. All of this is done as modeled as processes. So the process view is per pervasive. If Unix is everything as a file, the Erlang VM is everything as a process um, with its own private non-inspectable state. Um, yeah, and the memory usage is really low. So if, if I take like, CouchDB, um, which is another one of these that I've contributed to, another Erlang project. For CouchDB, the default install of the database without any actual data in it will only need about sort of about 7 to 80 megs of memory total. Um, and that's a really, really light footprint and all the rest of it is just data that you shove in. Um, and yeah, you can sort of see how it's connected here. Have I got CouchDB running on my... No, I don't have it running here. Okay, so, um, uh, but this observer node that we're viewing this stuff in is literally a full blown Erlang node um, and I can connect to it. Uh, and you see it's not running any applications. Um, it's got almost no processes, processes running. I've got to wait a second um, and only a few network ports. And this sort of distributed capability is Erlang's superpower. There's no need for these to be on the same machine and you can communicate just as easily with a local process as a remote one. But anyway, that's that's a little bit off the uh, the CI side of things, yeah. Is that your observer right. or it was pre-existing? 
Oh, this is, this comes with the with with Erlang since oh, cool. uh-huh. River. Um, yeah, it's, I'm new to Erlang. No, no, it's 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 a really it's a really impressive runtime, and um, you can see how this was really good for something like WhatsApp. So the WhatsApp is still written in Erlang, although it runs now on Linux because um, oh, when they moved to Facebook, Facebook said um, join the dark side. So instead of having, I think about. 30 or 40 really big FreeBSD boxes. They now have over 10,000 32 gig um, uh, um, Linux boxes, and they still use the same distributed messaging between them. Um, so every Erlang node can talk to every other Erlang node. But, but to, to be fair, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't 30 or 40 at WhatsApp. It was 30 or 40 public facing. All ah, right, was it okay? Yeah, it was thirty or forty public facing. The rest were the behind, and yeah. be, be behind the public facing. But I mean, the, it's it's impressive because they got like nine hundred million users with like less than two hundred machines. Yeah. And yeah. When, when when I tell this to the Kubernetes people, they're like, "No way, that's not possible." And then I have to explain to them that the cloud is really slow, or rather, the public cloud is really slow. <laughs> it is. It is really slow. Yeah, but uh, what do you mean you can have fast local storage? <laughs> <laughs> but my cloud instance has always 20 millisecond disk latency and 200 megabytes read speed. Any questions for Dave? And is this uh, Die Jenkins Die? Yes, definitely Die Jenkins Die. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not quite there yet, I think. To kill off Jenkins, for, for me personally, I need the file upload, and um, I need to I, I need the UCL parser stuff working, um, and that's trivial in Erlang because I've done it already, um, but I want to have it in the in the Lua stuff, um, and uh, yeah, doing using the curl WebSockets library, which is still um, in experimental mode. Has been really, really easy. Um, it's really well documented, and um, I think I had one question on IRC to ask, and everything else has just been read the docs. Um, so, and it sounds like Jan can help you out with schema goodies. Correct. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get to mute. That's okay. Mm. The main problem with the schema is that. Um, I haven't settled on one yet. I really wanted to try it out with an actual project and then go, okay, these ideas were bad. These ideas were good. Okay. Now I know what I need in a schema. Um, yeah. Cool. Any questions for Dave? And does this feel right, for lack of a better scientific term? I don't know the the, the web the web the website needs a lot more work uh, uh, a lot of work yeah. Antonig, you're a elixirator or langer. Any thoughts, ideas, suggestions? You know, I've been an elixirator before it was even called elixir. So Ooh, there you go. <laughs> my 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 idea is that this is really cool. I, I personally have have issues with WebSocket, but that's post, mostly because I don't understand it that well. It also, up to, till this day, it feels to me it's like it's a protocol that was built similar to JavaScript. Like someone thought, hey, we want persistent HTTP connections. And they ended up building WebSocket and it doesn't feel like complete, I, I guess. Hmm. Uh, but, 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 yeah, go on. Is now having having used it in anger directly, um, I'm pretty impressed with it. I think there's there's a couple of things that really stand out. It's it doesn't dictate what you put on the wire, and it doesn't have a lot of framing. Um, it's really comfortable in um, the sort of async world where you're maybe multiplexing many things onto um, onto each thread uh, or onto each each connection. Um, and it's not obese. Like when you see seen HTTP protocols, you go, okay, here's a thousand headers. Uh, and I've, I've seen, you know, kilobytes and kilobytes of, of headers jammed into stuff with, with HTTP. And, um, 
WebSockets works really well. It's a really nicely, clearly defined state machine, and it's yes easy to implement another WebSocket implementation in another programming language. Well, personally, I've not had to do that because every language I've wanted has two or three to choose from. Um, and so what happens is you you make your connection, then you add a couple of things to handle reconnecting and disconnecting, and then um, the rest is just adding data frames in and around that. Uh, yeah, really nice, really nice and, and quick. To, what, to what, I would, what I would like to know from your, this implementation of yours is, are you planning it on using it only for CI, CD stuff? Um, with it, so, oh, yeah, that's a great question. So the short answer is no. One of the reasons for doing the C version was not just because I could, or well, not because I could, because I wanted to see if I could, was because um, this sort of structure is not just for CI, CD. The, the, the core of this really is a, a system which says, I will receive messages and perform functions for you um, that may or may not be privileged and return the results. Um, and CI is just a special case of that where it starts off with clone me some stuff, run me some things, collect the output, and then repeat this across multiple servers. So you should be able to do something like um, in, in, the, in, the, in the future, deploy the, the Zen client to a node. It'll run its route, start up, connect to the whatever cluster of servers you've defined and await messages. And your first message might be, install me these containers, create these file systems for me. Um, and when all of that's done, um, tell me because then we'll, we'll start seeing some work your way. And that should be possible with us too. Um, that's where I'd like to get to for that, yeah, couple of years, maybe, <laughs> maybe and then some, yeah. But the, the yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Yes. Sockets and listen for messages that's already there. And if I do this right, um, MVP won't have that, but MVP plus one should be capable of listening to arbitrary messages and saying, okay, this doesn't look like a, a CI request frame. It's a request for some other protocol. Let's look in my Lua library. Oh, okay, you already wrote these things here for it. I will handle it over to the Lua thing and it will do the things you want. Nice. Um, and then what you should be able to do is, at least on FreeBSD, is deploy the core package, the Zen client package, and then drop in um, another package with whatever sort of custom hooks and commands you want, and it'll just start up and go, okay, um, I learned some new skills. I'll, I'll listen for the messages. Yeah. That, that'll be, at least for me personally, that'll be harder to do with the C stuff um, to figure out how to do that correctly. Very but cool. Yeah. Keep um, us posted. Go ahead on. This is this is this is so okay. I, I do have a, a question about this. So um currently um I'm using SSH as a as a protocol for jailer, and I finally integrated um SSH's, I think it's called command in the in the authorized keys where you're only allowed to run a single command. And that's been oh, working pretty nicely, you know. So the idea is uh, you you have a host, uh, you do a jailer init uh, control or jailer CTL, I think, uh, and it and it sets up sudo with the right permissions, and it sets up an SSH authorized key with a user called jailer. So like you always know, you have a user called the jailer who's responsible for managing your jails, and then you log out of, log out of the host, and you never have to touch the host ever again. Mm -hmm. uh, because now you, all of your ZFS, your DHCP and DNS are all managed. So, okay. Um, I'm using SSH as a protocol. And I, I honestly, as much as I like the simplicity of it, it doesn't extend very well. Um, I was actually thinking if it would make, if, if you think uh, if there is a way to use WebSockets to have as a, as a layer in there, or, or should I just write a CGI and be done with this? I think probably that would depend on who you ask. So for me, there's just three things. Um, the thing about SSH is it's probably like number one in terms of eyes on it, in terms of security. And it's really hard to write something that is as secure as SSH. Um, and I don't think personally I would be able to do that in any of the programming languages I know to be really 
certain that, that it's secure. Like the core of this thing is it forks processes and then hands stuff out to to root to do things for you. That feels quite dangerous. Um, the other diff so the second thing is um, SSH already provides you this um, sort of framework for having quite granular authorization. Maybe not in a pleasant way, but um, it's aware of users. Um, it's aware of um, handling forks correctly and cleaning up. And that's a lot of work to get right um, on any operating system. And this really isn't designed for that level of granularity. It's going to run as a user that can spawn tasks as root, maybe not directly, but um, through some sort of channel. Um, and I would want to, yeah, do you know, have you heard of, has anyone heard of macaroons or not here? Um, so macaroons is kind of like a special cookie. And the idea is that you take, you start off with a single super strong cookie, which is like your classic auth token for GitHub or something like that, which has full authority over your entire environment. And then what you do is each, you put another layer on the biscuit on the cookie, hence the macaroon, and each layer um, attenuates or reduces the privileges you have. And that's a um, exactly what you remove and what you allow is something that you, the developer, decide what to implement. And so what I wanted to do, not just for this, but for another project, is have a, um, uh, a macaroon layer where the token that you give to the agent um, only works on that IP address or um, it only works from this um, network um, or only between the hours of 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, whatever you like. Um, and then you're away from the situation of you lost your token to your CI and now you have no idea if someone else is using that to steal all your secrets remotely from a, from a server in a different country. Um, with the macaroons, um, I, I think that's kind of a neat, a neat use case for tools like this where you'll have, um, let's say, group your network into internet-facing servers, DMZ, and then some internal stuff with soft, juicy, um, juicy targets. And what you would do is you could have the same sort of automation system like you've seen here running all of these different systems and you give each of these servers their own um, macaroon and the DMZ servers will have one set of sort of um, privileges attached to them. Um, the internet facing ones will have a different set and your soft juicy targets on the inside will have a different one. And if someone steals one of those tokens, presumably from the internet facing ones first, then they try and use it outside. It just doesn't work anywhere else. It can't be used. Um, and it only allows one connection. And I think that'd be a pretty cool use case. But security is hard. Um, that's not really my forte. It would be really difficult to get all of that right. Good opportunity um, for someone else to contribute. Yeah. Uh, Patch is welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so I think as a quite simple way you can structure that remote code execution problem, uh, that would be by just having a basically command prefix, uh, an array of command line arguments you prefix to the command you're asked to run. And then you have basically a, somewhere a libexec directory with basically task runners and you configure them by basically just the, the command line and similar to sudo or SSH, they then do their part and execute the rest of the argument list. Yeah, I, I think maybe the, the, the problem with this is your privilege then becomes tied to your ability to parse the command that was sent to you. And that's you untrusted. You don't parse it. Well, you're still going to read it and then chop it off and say, well, this bit matches, I can do things. Um, and the idea with macaroons is that it's um, kind of like an HMAC. It's signed, it's tamper-proofed, and the, um, the, the rights are encoded in that. And so you have more flexibility about what you can and can't do, but more importantly, it's it's tamper-proof. If someone tries to um, insert backspaces and extra characters because your parser isn't very good, then that just breaks the macaroon completely and it's useless. Whereas in the sort of prefix matching type world, that's where you make a mistake because of things you didn't know about um, PTYs, um, and then it's all over. Um, yeah. I don't know. It wouldn't be too... Pass it at all, just 
append a prefix of arguments and then hand the whole thing off to the next part, which knows how to handle it so that you don't pass it. Other than just preserving the boundaries between arguments, but that you have to do anyway. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's where I like tokens and and things like that that are wrapped. Um, it's much harder to do harder to uh, much harder for people to to to, to fake and break that. Um, I'll just post a couple of these macaroons um, links in uh, in the recipe. Yeah, macaroons are awesome. Um, on, on, on a brief note about, about this here is one of the things I looked at is um, we need to hash the data before we send it to the server, particularly for files, the artifacts that people have created. And um, there's a massive difference in speed and hash algorithms. So Blake 2 is pretty fast, but single threaded. It takes like 17 seconds to hash an 18 gig file. So it does about one gig a second. Um, versus Blake 3 C implementation in parallel, and it does an 18 gig file, which is obviously loaded into memory already by ZFS, in 1.2 seconds. So um, I was originally going about this the hard way, reading a chunk, hashing it, then sending it out over, over, over the network connection, which is slow in comparison, and then getting the next chunk. And now I just hash the entire file in one pass with Blake 3, which is so much easier. Um, so it's kind of cool to see how modern CPUs and better software have made programming, which was more difficult, become much simpler um, at the expense of using a large library, obviously. Um, well, let's circle back. I look forward to those links. Yeah. Uh, uh, Blake Free B uh, or S already has a, a SIMD friendly tree hashing mode where you can run it. Tens of gigabytes per second. Yeah, that's the Blake 3 one that does that, the C implementation. Yeah, it's stock and oh. fast. And don't rule out the classics as long as you have um, hardware acceleration. Um, both AMD and Intel finally uh, added SHA to uh, 156 and 512 hashing instructions, oh, common uh, excuse. So, at that point, you're running also at a speed where uh, even the fastest multi-threaded uh, Blake view implementation has trouble catching up. Similar to how IS and hardware is faster than ChaCha20 and software. Oh. It's, it's, actually, it's actually funny. It's 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 quicker to hash the file than it is to cat it to dev null. Um, that's pretty funny. <laughs> hmm. OK, well, back to jail land. Um, thank you, Dave. Keep us posted. Do get that clock submission in. And uh, Chris, do you have any news? Are you still with us as we cross the European continent? Let Maybe me disappear for a second. Like someone stepped on the cat. Yeah, they're going to yell <laughs> at my kids and tell them to go to bed. Okay, got it. Chris, you muted again. Okay, no worries. Uh, have any topics come up before we get a quick tour of Jan's thoughts on putting varnish in front of mirrors? Okay, Jan, you had shared a, a quick demo before the call. Would you like to bring that back and tell us what you're achieving? Test. Test. Okay. You. Yep, you're back. So um, I've been messing around with jails and package base and so on, and found out that I was often limited by the official package mirrors because depending on what you're doing when you're creating jails and so on, you're fetching a lot of times because uh, each mm -hmm. jail has its own package cache. So not just is it slow, I'm also putting a lot of load on the package uh, mirrors and thereby on the community infrastructure are just fetching stuff repeatedly. And I looked at it, uh, could I maybe tr find out which packages I need and then copy them from the host cache to pre-populate the guest cache for the jail. 
uh, but uh, that would be annoying. And instead of but wait, uh, package repositories are signed. They don't really have to be transported over HTTPS uh, because mm. uh, the repository database uh, is signed by a public key and it contains uh, the cryptographic caches of all the packages in the repository so that you have your project uh, public key as root of trust. And then, so I can just use HTTP and then I can use a traditional HTTP cache but I didn't fancy uh, playing with Squid and it probably wouldn't scale to the bandwidth I would like it to have. So mm -hmm. instead I looked into uh, Varnish, what you can do and found out that the FreeBSD uh, package mirrors are configured about as ha uh, hostile to caching as they can be because they uh, are configured with a cache control header of maximum cache validity zero seconds and um, don't put it in any uh, shared caches. So yeah, it's that's nice. not helpful, but Varnish is flexible enough that I cannot just ignore that, but instead uh, I can take advantage of the fact that the mirrors reply with an e-tag header. Oh. So a unique identifier for this version of this yeah. content. And then Whenever I have a cache hit, I send take the get request, convert it into a head request for the uh, sorry. What are you, Michael? Uh, Excuse me for I, the background um, noise. I muted. No worries. Okay. Yeah. I uh, wrap the get request. It converted into a head request. Do an f modified since with the e tag. Compare that. And only when my cache uh, is still valid, I serve the cached uh, object. Otherwise, I uh, refill the cache and so that I never um, reply with a stale cache entry. And that can be done in a few lines of uh, varnish configuration language. It's a bit tricky because you have to use uh, restarts, but it works. And with that in place, I can package fetch at multiple gigabytes per second. What's a varnish restart? Like, like... Uh, so uh, it's norm varnish can restart the processing of a request so that I can turn one request into multiple ones so that ah, okay. I have two attempts basically. Yeah. Uh, I can share my screen for a second. If yep, sure. Uh, So if you, sorry. So um, I use directors to collect all the um, package mirrors to the lab, which work for me with a measured bandwidth into one uh, basically stack of uh, fallback um, options with the fastest one first and so on. So that I'm using the fastest one if it works and then the next fastest one and so on. Mm. So here is a little bit documentation for future me. Um, so Varnish internally has a little state machine uh, so if it receives, uh, it starts here and it has received a request. It looks at the request, decides, oh, is this the first time um, or do not. So uh, da -da. then it hashes the relevant fields and finds out that it's either a hit or it is a miss. If it's a miss, it has to just fetch because it doesn't have anything cached. If it is a hit, it validates that through the restart logic described here. So the goal is that uh, I do not want to add new uh, temporary errors by returning uh, stale cache entries. So um, I do not care under which name or IP address uh, a client talks to the cache. 
So it only looks at the URL. It ignores all headers because it's not a complicated web application I'm caching, just a package mirror. And there's a bit of extra logic in here to also um, tell the client if it has re received a cached uh, version. So in the end, now I can do curl. Can you still see the, this? Yep. Now let me make that smaller again, so. Hmm? Why does it? Give me a second. So if I run up, why is it not in? So, Double slash, that would be confusing. You'd think it would yeah. be that for what it's worth. <laughs> or is that? Have yeah, that, that would be a meaning. different URL. So it oh, doesn't, I don't think oh, I don't normalize it. Good point. I can try what happens. It should handle it, but I should just download it one extra time unless it's normalized. So let's try. No, it does that. Hmm. So it supports the double slash without thinking it's new? Yeah, or... so it does normalize it before. Oh, good. Cool. Yeah, but as you can see, uh, that's my uh, download speed. Nine gigabytes a second about locally from the cache, which, of course, not shabby. Hmm? So this, this also works for general package.freebsd.org, doesn't it? It's nothing specific to package base. It's not specific to package base. Uh... Yeah. And how long is this is something you could share and people could reuse now, or is yes. it? Yeah, I'll there's should... nothing. So what I then did to make sure that I use it as, um... yeah, f fudge the DNS. Yeah, I uh, yeah, exactly. I steal the DNS. So I inject the local data to override that. Yeah. So is that you could also just end, point the, uh, the package conf at it. So the so what it does now is uh, yeah, I left everything in place and then uh, so that's it. yeah. In this case, I just pointed at localhost. Yeah. So that it doesn't even go for VIP address, but yeah. Is but there anything you could... that you can do with the mirror support here so that it first tries your local cache and if it can't, it fetches it from the yep, mirror? But to do that, I would have to synthesize the SAV records. And I was. Oh, <laughs> so I think you have HTTP mirror type as well, and it would have some sort of fallback thing. Um, yeah, of course, you could can do that. But if my local varnish cache on my local machine is down, that's probably a bigger problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I could totally, uh, so if you do, uh, what is that? Um, yeah, host uh, dash T as a V, is it? Let's check. Yep, I remembered the syntax correctly. So here's a uh, stuff, and you could basically just hijack that domain. Uh, then, so if you just hijack this domain here, yeah, uh, that would also work. Because that's the one which has the highest priority, or the lowest, which is the what preferred one. 
So if basically, then it would try the other ones according to the normal resolution. But you still have to make sure that you uh, switch the protocol to unencrypted HTTP because otherwise you can't hijack the, it under the official name. Yeah. Uh, if you want to use TLS, which could make sense depending on what you're doing, uh, I don't see use, use for HTTPS between basically jails on the same host, but I've always well, sure. got checksums in it, so hmm? it's it all, con it's all validated. Anyway. So yeah. the transport security is only basically for your privacy, uh, so that some your provider doesn't know or whatever, or whoever else uh, sniffs the traffic doesn't know which package versions you're fetching and so on. Oh yeah. Yeah, and there are a few questions. Can we go through those? Sure. Dan was asking, could the official mirrors be less caching hostile? Yes. What, what, what are the mechanics that uh, dictate that? For that to know, um, you would have to speak with the ones configuring them because it depends oh. a bit on uh, the exact way they're doing the replication between them. Ah. In my opinion, it would be nice if the e tech was a cryptographic hash of the content. And But uh, Colin is also working on fixing the problem at a more fundamental level. At least he's mentioned it in some of the talks, uh, or was it at the uh, Dev Summit, that he finally wants to make the package uh, format on the mirrors uh, CDN friendly by including a truncated cryptographic hash in the package name so that you don't have to invalidate the cache because anytime the content of a package changes, uh, the truncated hash is expected to change with a sufficiently high probability that you've but that it's considered a solved problem. Uh, yeah. Okay. Dan, does that answer your question? So I, I think was before we see, to uh, it, but I'll catch it later. No worries. Um, the, the, okay. That's that I had some questions. That, Go ahead. That there is no problem for varnish. It just makes the config a few lines longer. And after what the problem is fixed for anyone running this configuration, at least. So, hmm. well, do reach out to him for what it's worth. Um, mm -hmm. Last week was perfect for that too. Uh, so I'm curious. You're caching locally, and well, first before that, well, sure. This question: Are you caching simply on your LAN and it, or on the, I don't know, jail host or somewhere? In this case, on one box uh, in my local lab environment, yes. Okay. Um, and then that said, when Varnish does its caching, is that purely to RAM? And does that get like doubled up in the arc just to make it painful? No, it's not. Uh, that, that's configurable. So I should have shared. Uh... So as you can see, uh, I've configured it to cache up to 50 gigabytes to a file. And oh, okay. um, I also defined my own locking class. Which has a memory limit so that if the host is under memory pressure, Varnish doesn't get to keep more than one uh, gigabyte of host memory resident. Cool. And I just validated that that is exactly what happens because when I compile started compiling FreeBSD uh, 14.1, the Varnish process uh, resident size shrank from seven gigabytes to one gigabyte. Uh, this happens because Varnish uses uh, AppMap files. So basically it, it has a file and yeah, it writes, in there were, in my configuration, two megabyte chunks of the cached objects so that it has good uh, disk locality and performance. And yeah, that's about it because two megabyte is the super page size so that I'm hoping it helps with um, 
GLB pressure, but I haven't measured, and it's probably not important, the expected real world data rate, if you're not doing artificial benchmarks by just running a curl in a loop or something. Cool. So I could now do something like this. Uh, let's say I uh, service varnish the stop. Now that takes a while because it's now flushing the process. So Z pool, it's still busy. No, it's already done. So if I start it up again, let's test what happens the next time. I'm so it's still fast because it, but not as fast. Now hmm. it's fast again because the cache is warmed up, but the cache was preserved across reboots. Interesting. Nice. So, well, but if I stop go. it now, let's uh, say I've lost my cache file, truncate. So I will now truncate the cache file, wiping the cache, restarting it. So the next time I'm doing the curl invocation here, This time around, it will be, what? Why is it fast again? Arc. And now, uh, All right. Stop. Truncate. Damn it. Why is that fast? So now the title is empty. Start. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, but um, so for the package query, yeah. oops, so let's do this. Um, I will find a big package to torture it. So here we have a really big fat package. Okay. So this time around it's slow, but the next time it should be fast. I can run while I live. So, um, let's have the Spanish lock running. For testing purposes. Hmm? It's running, okay. Yeah, okay, the download speed. But why is... Yeah, okay, here we can see what I meant. So here we get the first get request. Then this is rewritten into a where does it say had? Should somewhere here. Uh, what command gave that verbosity? 
war eine Schlag. Okay. So. Ja. Yeah, yeah. Here we have it. So here you can see that what I'm actually sending to the, in this case for the MetaConf to check if my uh, local package database is still up to date. Uh, the, what happens first is the get request arrives at the cache, then the cache has to ask the backend, but it doesn't really uh, because it has rewritten the get into a head. So it does not fetch the content, only the headers. Then it has processed the header to know that, oh, my cache is still valid. And this time around it passes that, okay. So I'm not returning uh, the empty body from the head request. So this is then the next restart and this finally gets processed normally and just hits the cache, which has just a few microseconds ago before being validated. And now I'm delivering that. And that's the same thing for another file. So yeah, it works. Very cool. Um, what's, what is actionable? Do you, will you do a blog post? Will you reach out to Colin? Will you um, become a cluster admin member? <laughs> yes, if I'm not have enough heads. Um, yeah, I should just document that for someone ready to just copy pasta ready. Other topics. I will share my screen, Dan. We've got your cave there. That's cool. Uh, there it goes. Well, anything else at this time? That's all very exciting. And I guess, Dave, think about how others can help. And um, Dave, if you're still there. Yeah, just muted. Yeah, that's all. Um, so to, for example, for uh, shell variables, I have something in the schema which looks a bit like, let me just throw that into chat. Um, the code formatting. Ah formatting. So this would be one of the nice things you can do is in JSON schema is you can restrict just the, the name of the keys in an object. This, for example, would use the regex to only allow uh, valid shell variable names. So it has to start with a to Z uh, or underscore, and then anything after that can also be a number. And the other thing which is I uh, suspect where you're hung at is um, this, uh, it should be a string or an array of strings or something. Um, I'm just, So what you can have is a one of and then So Jan, this one you pasted here, is that restricting the keys or the values to a specific The um, keys to match way? the keys in the object uh, have to match uh, that schema so so in this case, it restricts so that you can't have a, na a key in an object which you can't export as a shell variable. Ah, I see what you mean. That's that's nifty for the environment variable things I have. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. And the other, oh, well, and technically you can have environment variables which can't be shell variables. It's just that if you do, you uh, deserve what happens to you. Um. 
The other scheme is uh, maybe I should just grab the screen share again. So this here is then um, Um, so mid one off, you can say it either has to be, for example, a, a string or an array of strings. Yeah. Okay, that's boring, boring. Have we stopped recording? Not yet. So, uh, yeah, I suppose. I'll drop that syntax yeah. in there just for. So this is probably uh, the in most interesting part would be for you as something where did I use it? So you can say something uh, here matches. Here's an example. So you can have I define something called a match, and then matches is either a single match or an array of matches. Well, that said, how about we continue after the recording? And I yep. wish you all a great week. And thank you, Dan, for everything you've done for BSD CAN. Uh, you can do that with I any type you you've. In... Sorry. Oh, no worries. Uh, see you far, far away in perhaps uh, Dublin in the fall. So take care, everyone. See you. I will stop the recording. Like, like and subscribe. subscribe. Perfect timing. <laughs>